In its homeostatic role, the kidney undergoes several steps, the first of which is filtration of plasma water. This filtration step delivers some of the plasma water into a tubule, which is an epithelial structure. This filtrate undergoes modification as it flows down the tubule. A lot of what is filtered has to be reabsorbed. Some things that need to be got rid of can actually be added by secretion downstream from the filtration step. What comes out of this tube of epithelium at the end of the kidney is the urine, but it's very different in volume and composition to what was put in by filtration. We will talk in detail during this course about these various different processes. However, before we get into kidney function, we need to understand the structure of the kidney. The structure of the kidney is very complex and it's absolutely essential to understand the anatomical arrangements within the kidney in order to understand its function. So the goal of this lecture is to understand the structure of the kidney, both at the gross and microscopic level. We're going to look at the two main sets of structures, the blood vessels and the tubules in the kidney, see how they're arranged relative to one another. We're also going to talk about the renal tubule epithelium, which is responsible for reabsorption of filtered material that is required within the body. And we'll talk about the asymmetric structure of this tubule, which facilitates reabsorption. And then finally, we're going to briefly discuss the different segments in the tubule, which we will talk about much more later in detail when we discuss the important reabsorptive functions of the, of the kidney. So first of all, let's begin with the gross anatomy. There are two kidneys. And remember, there's the adrenal gland, which lies on top of each kidney, adrenal meaning next to the kidney. The kidneys lie at the back of the abdominal cavity. They're encased in fat, and they're encased in fat even in skinny people because it's important that this fat stabilizes the kidney. The kidneys receive arterial blood from the abdominal aorta, which passes through the renal artery, and then passes through a very complex pathway of blood vessels, which we'll discuss in detail, and exits through the renal vein, draining into the vena cava. You'll see that there's another tube system coming out of the kidney. This is the ureter, and this carries the product of kidney function, the urine, down to the bladder. So obviously, the processes that are occurring in the kidney involve handling and modification of the blood plasma to produce the urine. This is a cross-section of a human kidney. The human kidney consists of several lobes, usually about 10 to 12. Each, here, each of these areas that I'm outlining with the mouse is a lobe. The outer part of the kidney is the cortex. The inner part is the medulla. These are structurally very different parts of the kidney which have very specific roles and we will talk about how these different parts of the kidney contribute to the overall homeostatic function of the kidney in detail. Once urine has been formed and leaves the kidney, it drains out of the tip of the medulla into this collecting system. We have the minor and the major calyces which give rise to the renal pelvis and then into the ureter which is a muscular tube that carries urine down to the bladder. The urine is then stored in the bladder until it's removed via the urethra by the process of micturition. We will not be discussing micturition in this series of lectures. So we have two major sets of structures in the kidney. We've got very specialized blood vessels and we have the tubules, which are epithelial. First, we're going to talk about the vascular architecture. So as I said, blood enters the kidney through the renal artery the renal artery breaks up into several branches, which we call segmental arteries. And then these segmental arteries break up and surround each of these lobes. So we call these the interlobar arteries between the lobes. The interlobar artery runs up to the upper border of the medulla and the cortex. And then, let's use this one as an example, it changes its course and runs along parallel with the junction between medulla and cortex. And this is called the arcuate artery. Next comes the interlobular or cortical radial arteries. These are actually the first resistance site in the kidney. Here's another example. It's called cortical radial because they're radiating up into the cortex. This is a view of the renal microcirculation and what we have now is the outer cortex and the inner medulla. Again, here's our interlobar artery turning into the arcuate artery and then the cortical radial or interlobular artery. That's the older term. And as the cortical radial vessel penetrates up into the cortex, we see these small blood vessels originating from it. And these are arterioles. And these are the afferent arterioles. Afferent because they go into the glomerulus. And then you see the glomerular capillary, which is this meshwork of uh, fine capillaries, but quite different to the capillaries that we see in most parts of the circulation, where there's a branching, broadly distributed network. Here we see a very small, concise bundle of blood vessels. 
After blood has flown through the glomerular capillary, it goes through another resistance vessel, the efferent arteriole. That then gives rise to a second capillary network. And for most of the glomeruli, which are in the outer two thirds of the kidney, these are called the cortical glomeruli. The downstream capillary network is the peritubular capillaries. These peritubular capillaries are entirely within the cortex and they surround the proximal and distal tubules. And they're very important in reabsorption. We'll talk about their role later. About 10% of the glomeruli are deep in the cortex. Remember, all glomeruli are in the cortex, but these 10% are called the juxtamedullary glomeruli. Juxtamedulla means next to the medulla. These glomeruli have an afferent arteriole, glomerular capillary, and then an efferent arteriole, which now gives rise to a very different vasculature. These blood vessels plunge down into the medulla, and they form these loop-like structures, which are called the vasa recta. Vasa recta are very important in the kidney's ability to make a concentrated and dilute urine, and we will talk about the structure of these medullary uh, tubules and blood vessels in some detail later on in the context of the kidney's ability to maintain water balance. It's also important to notice that these glomerular capillaries where filtration occurs are in close proximity and contact to these tubular structures shown in yellow. The tubule is where modification of the filtrate occurs and we're going to look at the anatomical arrangement here at the glomerulus in more detail. Here's a cross section of a glomerular capillary, blood arriving through the afferent arteriole, and it will then pass through these individual capillary loops, which rejoin to form the efferent arteriole, where blood exits. The glomerular capillary is surrounded by this cup called Bowman's capsule. Bowman's capsule is epithelial, and it is the beginning of the tubule, which then forms the proximal tubule and goes on to form several complex sections, which we'll talk about later. When filtration of fluid occurs, as blood is flowing through these individual capillary loops, the water and small solutes in the plasma are forced across the capillary wall, and that is filtration, the first step in kidney function. Now, these capillary loops are quite unique. First of all, because they're capillaries, they have no contractile cell in the wall. But in the central core of the glomerulus, you see this mesangial cell, and the mesangial cell is a contractile cell. It's related to vascular smooth muscle, and it does have a contractile role. It can influence glomerular function. We'll talk about that later. It also makes things, and it has a phagocytic and immune clearing function as well. Now, the important thing to notice about these capillary loops is the rather unusual architecture. All capillaries, of course, consist of a layer of endothelial cells on the inside. This is the blood surface here. That endothelial, those endothelial cells lie on a basement membrane, this black line, which we call the glomerular basement membrane. And on the outside, we have this unique cell type called the podocyte. Podocytes are huge cells. They are abutting into the Bowman space. This is where the filtrate is being formed. And these cells give rise to projections called foot processes. And as you see, these foot processes have an extraordinarily uniform arrangement on the outside of the glomerular capillary. We'll talk about their functional role later. This shows a scanning electron micrograph of the outside of the glomerular capillary. So these tubes are the individual capillary loops. Inside these is the blood. The blood's in contact with the endothelial layer, which is lying on the basement membrane. And these outside cells, the podocytes, give rise to this very elegant and intricate set of structures which abut onto the outside of the capillary and form pores. When we take a transmission electron micrograph of the glomerulus, we see this. This is the inside of the capillary lumen. This is where the blood is. These are the endothelial cells. These endothelial cells are fenestrated. They have great big gaps between them. Here is the glomerular basement membrane. This is not cellular. It's a gel layer, which is supported by a matrix, extracellular matrix, different collagens and other structural proteins. And then on the outside, we have these foot processes. This is the podocyte body. And here you see the individual foot processes as they sit on the outside of the capillary. Each of these foot processes produces a slit, which is uniform in size. And these slits or pores are covered by a fine diaphragm. Now we're going to look at the second set of structures in the kidney, the tubules, the epithelial tubules, which receive the filtrate and which are responsible for modification of that filtrate, which eventually becomes the final urine. So this is the cortex, the outer part of the kidney, and this is the medulla, the inner part. And we routinely divide the medulla into an outer part and an inner part. And the inner medulla is sometimes called the papilla. 
Let's start out here with these cortical glomeruli. Remember, 90% of the glomeruli are in the outer two thirds of the cortex, and we call those the cortical glomeruli. This glomerulus is surrounded by the Bowman's capsule, which gives rise to the proximal convoluted tubule. This is the first part of the tubule. The proximal convoluted tubule is entirely in the cortex, and this diagram does not do justice to how long and convoluted this segment is. At the end of the proximal convoluted tubule, the direction changes and plunges down deep into the cortex and eventually enters the outer most part of the outer medulla. This is the proximal straight tubule, also sometimes called the pars recta. As this tubule dives down deeper into medulla, it changes and becomes the descending limb of the loop of Henle. The loop of Henle goes down into medulla and forms a hairpin turn at various different levels and then returns up back into cortex as the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. The loop of Henle turns into the distal convoluted tubule back in the cortex. There's a connecting tubule and an initial collecting tubule, but we don't worry about these. We're going to call all of this segment the distal convoluted tubule. And eventually the distal convoluted tubule drains into the collecting duct. Now, although it's called the collecting duct, it does a lot more than collect. It does a lot of modification of the final urine. And the collecting duct now plunges down through the cortex. This is the cortical collecting duct. And then down through medulla, the outer medullary and inner medullary collecting duct. It's only when fluid exits from the inner medullary collecting duct at the tip of the medulla that it becomes the final urine. Now, we tend to lump anything downstream from the loop of Henle together. So we often refer to the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct as the distal nephron. And we'll talk more about why we tend to put these together later on. Finally, there's this anatomic arrangement that I want to point out to you. Every ascending limb of the loop of Henle comes back and makes contact with the afferent arteriole that supplies its tubule. That contact point in the tubule involves a very specialized type of epithelial cell called the macula densa. It's an area of communication between the tubule and its blood vessel supply. And we'll talk about the implications of that later on. But it allows the tubule to communicate with its own blood vessel. We've talked about the cortical glomeruli, that's 90% of the population in the glomeruli, and the tubules that they supply. Let's now look briefly at these juxtamedullary glomeruli. These are deep glomeruli. Again, the basic structure of the tubule is similar. Proximal convoluted tubule, proximal straight tubule, which turns into a loop of Henle. These juxta medullary glomeruli give rise to very long loops of Henle. Here, the descending limb plunges deep into the inner medulla, makes its hairpin turn, and has a long, thin ascending segment. This transforms into the thick ascending limb, which comes back and makes contact with the parent afferent arteriole, then the distal convoluted tubule, and then the collecting duct. Here again is this figure where we can see the, the blood vessels together with the tubules. Again, these are the cortical glomeruli, which supply the majority of the tubules in the human kidney. And these have a loop of Henle, which does not usually penetrate very far into medulla. About 10% of the glomeruli are juxtamedullary, and these have very long loops of Henle. These juxtamedullary glomeruli give rise to these loop-like blood vessels, the vasa recta, which parallel the path of the tubule loop of Henle. In the cortex, the cortical glomeruli give rise to the peritubular capillaries, and these stay entirely within the cortex and are responsible for picking up reabsorbate, mainly from the proximal tubule. We will talk in more detail later about these different populations of glomeruli and blood vessels. Just to come back to this point of apposition between the top of the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle and the afferent and efferent arteriole, this area is called the juxtaglomerular apparatus, the JGA. This is the top of the thick ascending limb, and we have the specialized plaque of epithelium called the macula densa. And this is in contact with these extra glomerular mesangial cells. We saw this figure earlier, and I was talking to you about the intraglomerular mesangial cells, which have contractile and other functions. These extra glomerular mesangial cells form a point of communication between the tubule through the macula densa and to the afferent arteriole. So in this anatomic arrangement, the tubule is able to communicate with the afferent arteriole. One set of signals coming from the tubule affect vascular tone, and we'll talk about that when we talk about renal hemodynamics. Another set of signals coming from the tubule affect these specialized granular cells. These granular cells are, are the site of renin synthesis and release. They are modified vascular smooth muscle cells, and they are located close to the pole with the glomerulus. We'll talk about the importance of renin regulation and release 
later on when we talk about control of sodium balance. Now, we have a large amount of fluid being delivered into the tubule lumen, and most of it has to be reabsorbed. This is a cross section showing you the tubule. Epithelial cells, which form a cylinder and are joined together by tight junctions. In most parts of the body, the cells contain the sodium potassium ATPase everywhere. But in transporting epithelial, they are asymmetric. That is, the sodium pump is only on the outside or peritubular surface of the cell. The inside surface, the luminal surface or apical surface, has no sodium potassium ATPase. And that's functionally very, very important because as we'll see, we're filtering a large amount of sodium from the blood into the tubule. And almost all of that sodium has to be reabsorbed back into the body. If there was a sodium pump here, then any sodium that tried to get across this wall would be pumped back out. So clearly, in order to reabsorb sodium, there has to be structural adaptations leading to this asymmetric arrangement of sodium potassium ATPase. So on the luminal side of the uh, tubule epithelium, there are various types of transport mechanisms or pores or channels which allow sodium to cross into the cell. Once in the cell, the sodium will be picked up and ejected across the peritubular side of the cell by the sodium potassium ATPase. So this arrangement then allows the unidirectional transport of sodium from lumen right out across the cell into the peritubular interstitium where it can be picked up by those peritubular capillaries and returned to the blood supply. We see a similar arrangement in the gut also where we have this asymmetric epithelium. This goes back to the tubule structure and when we look at different parts of the tubule, they appear very different morphologically. The proximal tubule have a lot of mitochondria and have a very rich brush border. Now a brush border is a way of increasing the surface area. And when you see a brush border, either in the proximal tubule or in the small intestine, this means that there's a very active amount of transport across this region. The descending limb of the loop of Henley is a very basic, simple tube like structure. It has very little activity in it, as we'll see later. It's just a way of getting the tubule fluid to the ascending limb of the loop of Henley. And the thin ascending limb has very little structure to it, but the thick ascending limb is very complex. Again, lots of mitochondria, lots of activity. Now we get to the distal convoluted tubule. Again, a lot of activity. And now we go into the final portion of the tubule, the collecting duct. And here we see two different cell types. We see the principal cells. They're called the principal cells because over 60% of the cells in the collecting duct are principal cells. And then the remaining intercalated cells. And we now know that there are several different types of intercalated cells. We're going to talk about these different segments and what their role is in body fluid homeostasis in some detail later on. Finally, let's spend a minute to consider the renal nerves. The kidneys have a very rich innov innovation. The efferent innovation is mainly sympathetic. Sympathetic nerve fibers go to the afferent and efferent arterioles and also directly to the tubule epithelium. They have projections in the proximal tubule and the thick ascending limb. The neurotransmitter is norepinephrine and these are functionally very important. We will talk about these renal nerves as we talk about control of kidney filtration and sodium reabsorption. There is no significant parasympathetic innovation to the kidney. There are a few non-adrenergic fibers and they're called non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic fibers, NANC, and in some of these anyway, nitric oxide is a neurotransmitter. We don't still know much about these nerve fibers, but they're relatively few of them. In addition to the efferent control by the sympathetic nervous system, there are also a lot of afferent or sensory nerves. There are two types. There are chemoreceptors, and these respond to the composition of the urine. And there are mechanoreceptors, and these respond to the degree of perfusion of the renal tissue. And anyone who's ever passed a kidney stone will know that these mechanoreceptors are very sensitive. So we've talked today about the structure of the kidney, the two basic units, the blood vessels and the tubules, which come together and interact to perform the functions of the kidney. We've talked about the structure of the glomeruli, the unusual vascular supply, where there's an afferent and an efferent arteriole. This is unique in uh, capillaries. Um, we talked about how the efferent arterioles of the cortical glomeruli, which are the majority, give rise to peritubular capillaries, and these are located entirely in the cortex, but how the blood supply of the deep juxtamedullary glomeruli give rise to vasa recta, which go deep into medulla. And then we've also begun to talk a little bit about the tubular organization and how the different segments are morphologically different.